Minecraft always has more things to know about it, so in this video I'll show you 20 of the most interesting facts, tips, and tricks you didn't know about the game. Powdered snow is found frequently across different mountain biomes in Minecraft, especially the snowy slopes. But this item might seem fairly useless, however that couldn't be further from the truth. And believe it or not, most of these uses are best inside the nether. So to start, if you've ever tried an MLG water bucket in the nether, you'll notice there is a bit of an issue. The water will actually instantly evaporate. However, this is simply not the case with powdered snow. As you can see right there, we can place down that powdered snow, and if we can put it down right before we reach the ground, we can save our lives and not take any damage. But another even more important and nether related use. So if you fall into lava by accident and you're burning to death, what do you do to put yourself out as of course water will absorb? We'll simply place down a bucket of powdered snow at your feet, and although that powdered snow will be absorbed and disappear, it'll actually put you out of being on fire. This is really important too if you're exploring around the nether and you need a quick save. A couple buckets of powdered snow can do wonders. A big issue that you can sometimes face inside of Minecraft is not being able to find enough fuel to smelt your items. But if you're anywhere near any Badlands variants of biomes, here's a really great tip to not have that issue. Simply craft yourself a pair of shears and run around the Badlands biomes, breaking the insanely common dead bushes that are here. Dead bushes are basically as common as grass in this biome, so after maybe 20 seconds of collecting, we've already gained over a stack of dead bushes, and these can work as a fuel. Simply place these in the lower slot of the furnace, place in the item you're trying to smelt, and it will smelt through these items. Now, though it's not the most efficient fuel, so it does cost two dead bushes to smelt one item. This isn't actually that bad, because if you consider it, how easy it was for these dead bushes to get, for a biome that really doesn't have very many trees around it, this is a great way of obtaining yourself some instant fuel. And besides, the dead bushes are pretty well just decorative anyway, so it actually gives a use to this item. One of the most overlooked features of Minecraft is the bubble column. Bubble columns are actually really overpowered and have some really crazy abilities that they can do. We now have this sort of strange bubble pond. If we bridge over to the center and start placing down sand blocks, what basically happens in Minecraft is that when an item falls, like let's say sand or an anvil or gravel or even concrete powder, is it'll turn it into an entity. In fact, you can kind of see that down here, all these white boxes and blue lines. That's because these are turning from a block into an entity form. And because of that, they can intersect with each other. And what's actually pretty crazy is at this stage, if we light a piece of TNT and we make that explode right in the center of those blocks, what'll happen happen as it will blow those sand blocks everywhere, but because they're being blown around in their sort of item form, they'll then place down and go on the ground as sand blocks. So you can kind of have sand blocks be randomly placed around your world. Shulker boxes for sure burn in lava and blocks of netherite, and of course all other types of netherite will not burn in lava. So you might be asking yourself what'll happen if I have a shulker box full of netherite tools and by accidentally it falls in lava. So if we take one of these shulker boxes that are full of items and we toss it in the lava, let's watch really carefully what happens. Once it goes in there, all the items appear out of it and then those items also individually burn. What this means is if we take a shulker box full of netherite and we toss that in the lava, all that netherite will come spewing out of it and it'll actually stay unburnt about to float up to the surface there of the lava. This is actually really great because if the shulker box did not have those items fall out of it first all those items would disappear just like all the items inside of these shulker boxes because they're things that can be burnt with lava. So for example right here let's put down fire burn a shulker box in it have that shulker box stay on fire there when it finally burns all the way then you can see all the items pop out on the floor there. Malays are a great mob inside of Minecraft and they have some really interesting uses. But one of the most unique functionalities is their no friendly fire feature. What this means is that if an LA is not tamed to anyone, meaning there's no item in its hand, they can be hurt by things like arrows or swords or whatever, well they're actually a very difficult mob to defeat. But anyway of course this means in certain scenarios like this, we could shoot at these pigs from far away, and once the pork chops have been dropped, those LA's will return the pork chops to us. Like right over there, they were dropped, the LA's go over there and we grab them again. But of course this method has one issue, and you might see it already. It's the fact that when we're shooting at these pigs, we could very easily hit those delays when trying to just hit the pigs. Thankfully, this is not actually possible. In fact, look at this. We're trying to fire these delays right now. Those arrows will literally bounce off of the delays. They are not able to hit the delays. In fact, funny enough, we literally hit ourselves that way. Evokers are a very dangerous mob in Minecraft, and they have two main attacks. The first attack is this, summoning in vexes. But the second attack is a bit more close range. 
You can see it's having those massive claws coming out of the ground to try and kill the player. But here's something kind of interesting you might not know. You can actually tell which one of those the evoker is going to do based on its particle colors. That's right, unlike these vindicators, there's actually a really easy way of knowing how they're going to attack you. So if the particles coming off of its hand are gray, that means it's summoning in vexes. If they're kind of purplish maroon though, that means it's summoning in the claw hands. You can see that right there, purplish maroon particles, claw hands. So you can see it turns gray, we then have more vexes. So by simply looking at this, you can see if the color is grayish, or in other words, sort of resembling the vex, it'll be summoning in vexes. But if the color is purple, it'll be summoning in those claw hands. There's a whole group of items in Minecraft you might have completely forgotten about. And that is the mud group of items. The mud is basically only found inside the mangrove swamp. But then this mud is not crafted directly into something. No, in fact, the way of turning this into the mud family of items, you need to go and harvest some wheat. So with the wheat we've now harvested in the crafting grid, place down your wheat and your mud in the crafting grid in a shapeless recipe. One wheat and one mud turns into packed mud. Now packed mud is a decent looking block, nothing amazing, but it does have some nice sounds to it. However, with the packed mud, you can then craft that directly directly into the mud brick. The mud brick has a really interesting texture to it, sort of with these small, very square bricks in them, almost squished looking in a sense. And there are full sets of variants for all these items. So for instance, we have the mud brick wall, mud brick stairs, as well as the mud brick slab. If you've played Minecraft for a very long time, this desert temple may look familiar to you. But if you've not played Minecraft since the very old days of the game, it'll just look kind of weird. Now the only actual difference between between this desert temple and the modern ones is that instead of there being terracotta right here, there is wool. And that's actually because of a very interesting history of the game. Basically, it wasn't until Minecraft 1.6 when hardened clay, then that later renamed to terracotta, was added to the game, that there was any colored block in the entire game except for wool. Of course, certain blocks had color to them, but no block could be in literally every single color except for wool. And so because of that, when the developers added the desert temple to the game, they had to use orange wool for its decorations, and even in the center here to use a piece of blue wool. This even meant that players, if they wanted to, could literally craft a bed out of wool that they found in a desert temple. In my opinion, one of the most overlooked uses of honey in the entire game is the candle. Now how do you actually make candles, you might be wondering if you haven't made them before. Well, they're made with honeycomb, which is of course collected by right-clicking on bees nests with shears. Then these are really simply crafted with string and honeycomb. One string and one honeycomb gives you one candle. Well, basically there is one secret use of candles that a ton of people do not actually know about. So what you want to do is get out some cakes. Then get yourself an area to put your cake on top of. And once you've done that, you can right-click on the cake with any of these candles that you want. Unfortunately, we cannot have multiple candles on this cake, and we can't even break that candle off of the cake. But the great thing is we can use a flint and steel, right click on that candle cake to light that candle, and now we have a birthday cake, or even just a cake for any celebration you want. Turtles have changed in a big way in Minecraft recently, and I think it's very important that every player knows about it. So turtles are bred by collecting seagrass on the bottom of the sea floor. You right click on two turtles with that seagrass, they will very slowly walk towards each other, and eventually one of the turtles will become pregnant with eggs. After kicking in the sand for a long time, making an insane same amount of particles, we will have these little turtle eggs. And something you may notice is if we right click on this turtle, we can't breed it again. Why is this? In fact, none of these turtles will be bred again. Well, the reason why this might seem strange is the fact that turtles used to be able to be bred infinitely. That's right, there was no cool down timer for turtle breeding. But unfortunately, according to Mojang, this was actually a bug, even though it was in the game from 1.13 all the way up into a version of 1.19. And so now with turtles, like every other mob in the game that can be bred, you have to wait an entire five minutes till you can breed them again, as there is that cooldown timer. Ruined portals. Why are they in the overworld? This is a really good question for every Minecraft player to ask, if you consider the fact of how incredibly common these are across the overworld, but even across the nether. In fact, I'm sure if nether portals could be made in the end, there would also be ruined portals that were there. So you might be wondering why are these across the overworld and nether? That's the fact that these were built by the piglins to invade the overworld. This is confirmed in Minecraft Legends. Basically, that's
that's exactly how it works. The piglins using these piglin portals are using them to go from the nether to the overworld and from the overworld to the nether. That's also why we have this strange sort of nether invasion of the overworld. With these nether blocks and also the magma blocks around the portal. The idea of course would be is that the portal is leeching parts of the nether into the overworld. But if that was truly the case, it'd be kind of cool if the ruined portals that are inside of the nether actually have grass blocks, a couple flowers, and some other overworld blocks around them. If you see right here, occasionally inside of here we get this small drip leaf item. So what's the difference between these two items? Well, tall drip leaf is actually drip leaf. It's quite useful. You can use it for parkour or just decoration, and it's also very easy to grow and get your hands on. But with the small drip leaf, the story is completely different. To start with, instead of the large drip leaf, where it's quite easy to collect with anything, with the small drip leaf, which is this item right here, it can only be collected with shears. As well as that, you're probably wondering, well, how do you get more of the small drip leaf, and what's even the point of this item? The crazy thing is, there's basically no other way of getting the small drip leaf. There is one, but it only puts it into the technically renewable category, as it is pretty difficult. And I'm sure most people going through lush caves honestly even forget the small drip leaf even is there, as it kind of just looks like a weird mix between tall grass and standard drip leaf. The only other way of getting small drip leaf is by buying it from the wandering trader. In an interesting trade, it is one emerald for two small drip leaf. But let's talk about another item that is somewhat related to the lush caves. To get this item, you want to place down a moss block and bone mill that moss block for a while until you find an azalea bush. Bone mill the azalea bush and underneath it will appear a singular block of a substance known as rooted dirt. So with this rooted dirt, if you bone mill it and there's air beneath it, you'll actually get from there if you have the correct tool to break it. Hanging roots. Well, hanging roots are useless. They're completely useless. There's literally no use in the entire game for the hanging roots. I'm actually kind of annoyed by that because why would Mojang add an entire item in the game for a very rare decoration? And here's the part that bothers me the most. There's actually no way of crafting more rooted dirt. The issue is, is, if we take these hanging roots, put them in the crafting grid of dirt, nothing. There is no way that we can convert those hanging roots and dirt into the rooted dirt item. If you're ever inside of an amethyst geode, you never expect this to be a light source. But if we drink a bucket of milk, you can see it actually is. In fact, amethyst clusters cause light. That's correct, we can even see it around here. So for example, even at the very smallest size of the amethyst cluster, you can notice when placing down this block, it becomes very lighter in its texture. And that's because this one block lets out a light level of one. And the slightly larger amethyst this cluster, this one right here, this is the medium amethyst bud. This lets out a light level of two, so of course just one larger. Then if we break one of these clusters that's at the third size, this one right here actually, and place it down, what level is this? This is at light level four. So it actually jumps up two light levels to be light level four. And finally at the largest size, what light level is this? We'll go to a completely dark area to find out. We'll place this down, and on this block, the light level is light level 5. Minecraft's next version, Minecraft 1.20, is going to be adding a new item that you may not know about. What am I talking about? Well, it is the new piglin head. The piglin head's obtained one way, and that is when a charged creeper explodes a piglin. Now this mob is the first new mob head to be added to the game for an incredibly long time, so this is actually pretty big news. Well, unfortunately, if you put on a piglin head instead of the gold helmet, they will not become passive to you automatically. However, there are some cool effects with it. So for instance, if you're walking with the piglin head, the ears on the head will actually move. So for example, if we place down a block of redstone and place the piglin head on top, those ears, in a very funny and sort of odd with each other motion, will move back and forth, waving in the breeze. We can decide to turn that on and off, even saving it at certain stages. There are certain blocks in the game, like let's say oak wood, spruce wood, that everyone's using all the time. However, there's also certain other building blocks that actually do a great job with making builds, but they're not used very often at all. Well, those are the mushroom blocks. These are obtained by breaking giant mushrooms with a silk touch axe. Let's say we place down a wall of these brown mushroom blocks. This is basically the only block in the game that has this functionality. If we place down certain blocks next to it, we break them again, texture changes. You'll notice here what basically happens is the exterior bark is kind of pushed to the outside. And so by doing this, we can do something really awesome. Having the outside of our house be one color, having the inside of our house being another color. This effectively gives you the ability to have wallpaper inside of the game. This can be done the same way with the red mushroom block as it has the same interior texture, 
And also with the mushroom stem. Did you know that trains exist in Minecraft? It's true. Now you might be thinking I'm talking about minecarts, but that is not at all the case. It is definitely a bit fuzzier than a minecart, and that's the fact of llama trains in Minecraft. And these do not have to be with tamed llamas either, they can be any type. Just go up to a llama with a lead and right click on it with that lead, and suddenly all the llamas around it will organize themselves into a train. You can see that happening right there, it's actually pretty funny. And basically they'll all connect to each other now, and just follow in a big row like this. And we can walk pretty quick with this too, they'll again just walk around with us like this. If we have a ton of llamas, we can lead on to another llama, get all those llamas to make a train, we now have two llama trains following us. I find these to be incredibly hilarious. Hilarious, and believe it or not, they actually tend to stay together quite a bit. Even the llamas at the very back there are still going to keep up as they're kind of linked into this llama train. If you've played Minecraft for very long, you'll know that slimes come in three sizes, large, medium, and small. But do they really only come in three sizes? By the use of commands, you can actually get some insane slimes in the game. So slash summon slime, then of course the location where it's being summoned to and its size, by going bracket size colon 50 bracket, and you can do this at any size you want, but you can have this be as low as 0 or as high as 126. Let's go wild and try 126. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. In fact, the slime actually died. It fell for so long when it hit the ground. But even its two slime babies here, from where it was split in half, are massive. These slimes are incredibly crazy in multiple ways. Their speed is completely monumental. But the other thing too is that it's almost impossible to actually hit them because they're so large and their hitbox is kind of hidden in the middle of that mob. And so because of this to defeat these insanely large slimes is nearly impossible. Outside of a zombified piglin gold farm, I would definitely not recommend fighting zombified piglins. However, here's a really interesting fact you may not have known about them. Actually, here's two things you might not have known about them. The first thing is if you kill a zombified piglin instantly, which is done easiest with a smite sword, the other zombified fight piglins around will not get mad at all. And as you can see right here, I'm literally going through these super easily. In fact, I don't even have to do crit attacks, I just have to be careful for any side hits, they could potentially make those other piglins mad. But anyway, what's kind of interesting is if we look at all the drops from this, I did get from it a bunch of gold nuggets and rotten flesh, but also a gold ingot. And sometimes you'll get a bunch of gold ingots. And the gold ingots tend to be a fairly common drop from them actually, but what's quite interesting, remember this fact that if you're killing them by hand instead of in an automatic farm, depending on how the farm works, you'll tend to get those ingots instead of just nuggets. And now for one final nether related fact. Spreaders are of course the mob in Minecraft that are obsessed with perfect warped funguses on a stick. But as well as that, there is the fact that the striders themselves were placed in the game for multiple reasons. Of course the first one was sort of to give us a nether boat, but the second reason might even be more interesting than that, and that is it stands for the question how did piglins get string for their crossbows in the nether? I hate to do this, but unfortunately to solve this problem we have to actually kill the poor striders, because the striders have one pretty good drop and that is string. Now of course you might be wondering there must be some other way in the nether to get string, but there actually isn't and so because of that the striders are the one way that those piglins must be getting their string is by hunting these poor mobs. And if you wait for a bit they can actually go shockingly quick like this strider right here with speeds rivaling that of a slow boat. Anyway I hope you enjoyed that video of 20 things you didn't know about Minecraft including facts, tips, and tricks. If you did make sure to press the like button, subscribe to see more content like this, and and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.